Welcome for those of you just joining. Uh, we're doing a quick poll just so we can have a good gauge of who's in our audience so we can make sure we're meeting your uh, perspective as we share our, our conversation today about the comprehensive learner record. While you're doing that, I'll start with some introductions of our panel. If you want to take the time to complete that panel, we'd appreciate it. So we have a number of institutions here to share their perspective and their um, stories about how their comprehensive learner record projects have impacted not only their institutions, but especially their students. So I would like to introduce Incia Bream, the Assistant Vice Provost from the University of Maryland Global Campus. Uh, Mackenzie Hall, who is a graduate apprentice at, in the Registrar's Office of Elon University. We have April Jolly from the University of Central Oklahoma, where she's a student there. And then we have Jeff King, who is the Executive Direct for, Director for Transform Learning at the University of Central Oklahoma. And then we have Alexander Taylor, the Assistant Registrar from Elon University. So thank you all for joining us today. It looks like most of you have um, completed the poll, so I'm going to end that quick and I'll show, let you see the results of that. So as you can see, there's a good mix of people from both the information technology area as well as registrars and academic affairs area, a few of you from the other um, areas. And then some of you are in the fully implemented stage of CLR, but most of you are in that planning or investigation stage. So this panel will really help um, kind of share their insights from you. And it looks like we have almost um, a 50-50 mix, but not quite of those who have already picked their product for generating their CLR or have a platform selected and some of you are still looking. So just a couple of reminders that this event is really designed to help you get some information about a comprehensive learner record program, um, really building that community so that this is a, a place for you to have conversations and meet with others and really understand the impact that a CLR can have on your institution and a way for you to figure out um, what you need to do to be successful in that initiative. This is really focused on building that community and for you to ask questions of each other and share your resources. So feel free to um, be active in the chat and later if you wanna pick up your mic and actually ask questions, we appreciate that. This is a monthly event. So if you haven't, um, there's always our CLR event page. So that will be a great way for you to either see the viewing of the recording or also to sign up for future events. We will be shifting for our September event. We're gonna actually ask for pre-registration. So it's easier for us to follow up with resources and things like that. But because we didn't do a pre-registration for this event, we do have a way for you to um, sign in that you were here at the meeting so we can follow up with an email that will contain all the resources that are shared as well as the recording. And that link is there and Jeff um, will assist me in putting it in the chat for me. Um, so if you wanna just complete that quick form, it'll tell us that you were here and we can follow up with any of our resources as well as the recording for you. Before we start, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff Bohr from IMS to give you just a little bit of background about the comprehensive learner record since some of you are still in that investigation stage. Well, thanks Kelly. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jeff Bohr. I'm a technical program manager at IMS. And on, be on behalf of IMS, welcome to uh, number three uh, in our roundtable series on the Comprehensive Learner Record. Um, we're honored that you, during this busy time of this season right now, everyone's uh, up to their eyeballs in preparations and, and executing on those preparations for the fall term. We're honored that you spent um, the, this hour with us, um, so welcome. Um, yeah, I just had a few high-level remarks about the Comprehensive Learner Record um, before we hear from our institutional leaders and, uh, and a student on their um, experience with uh, their CLR programs. Um, so first of all, you know, uh, if you come to an IMS event, you're going to hear the word ecosystem and specifically the digital ecosystem. And so today um, we're thinking about the comprehensive learner record as part of our um, digital learning uh, ecosystems and the digital credentials ecosystem itself is a part of that. So the CLR is a digital artifact that is designed to be issued by an institution, by an organization. Uh, to an individual, um, and that issuing organization can be a school district, a university, or even an employer. Uh, the information that's contained within that CLR can be any type of learning achievements, such as uh, courses and grades and alternative credentials like certificates and badges, uh, skills, uh, could even be a record of professional training and professional certifications. So, in this ecosystem with the person at the center, they're able to receive their CLRs 
and then using CLR compatible tools like wallets or portfolios, uh, they're able to share those verifiable achievement records uh, and skills, or verifiable skills as well, uh, with employer, uh, uh, potential employers or um, other educational institutions. And so those um, uh, verifiable achievement information is very powerful for un unlocking opportunities for uh, the student down the road. Um, so this is the CLR ecosystem where the data is shareable and interoperable because all the parties and tools in the system are using a common standard, which we'll talk about um, a little bit later in the, in the round table. So the CLR is uh, a new and unique type of digital record in that it's been designed exclusively for learning experiences and it's meant to be an official record from an organization. Uh, as I mentioned, the learner or employee is in control of the record uh, and they're able to share that uh, with whomever they wish. And the recipient of that information can trust the authenticity of the CLR and the data inside of it because each achievement in a CLR uh, is verifiable itself. Uh, we must recognize um, our good friends and colleagues uh, at ACRO, the American Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers. They've been a long, long time supporter of institutions, early CLR uh, explorations and projects. And in May, IMS was very pleased to see that ACRO uh, came out with a recommendation after reviewing the CLR standard and they're recommending that any post-secondary uh, projects that are related to student records um, adopt the CLR standard uh, from IMS. So we're not here today to talk about the technical uh, aspects of the CLR standard. That's coming up in a future roundtable, um, but what we wanted to do was kind of connect the dots with how these campus projects fit into an emerging connected uh, ecosystem of digital artifacts that are verifiable uh, and focused on skills and learning achievements. So without taking up any further airtime, um, I'd love to turn it over to our colleagues, uh, I believe at Elon, yes, Elon, uh, for talking more about their project. Xander, are you up first? Yep, uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, so to start things off, um, we just wanted to kind of give a brief overview of our comprehensive learner record. Um, we've had our comprehensive learner record um, as a, a historic document since, 1990, uh, since the 1990s. Um, it wasn't actually taken um, into the registrar's hands until about 2016 um, when our, the university registrar um, took his role and noticed the, the importance and the value of our co-curricular learning, uh, our experiential learning. And so um, created systems, created the, the pathways or um, kind of the pipeline from the, the start of the experience to the completion um, and resulting in the final transcript and everything. Um, and so at Elon, we practice five high impact uh, experiential learning practices, um, those being research, uh, internships, study abroad, leadership and service learning. I think I got all five. Um, and so we've been working with ACRO. Uh, we were fortunate to be a part of the first pilot project um, in 2017 uh, with the partnership with ACRO. Um, and so in the past three years, we've um, learned a lot. We've tested and um, trialed a lot of different projects, marketing outreach to students. Um, and so we hope to be a, a helpful resource when it comes to um, ideas that we've tried the outreach for our campus partners as well as the student partnership. Um, how do we get students informed with that information? Um, I guess the last thing that I'll point to um, is up on the, the top. Um, we have our experiential learning tied to our curriculum. Students are required to complete two units of experiential learning in order to graduate from Elon. Um, students are aware that they need to complete those, but I think the well, the comprehensive learner record and all of this is kind of shaped is how do we get students from the very beginning, from their first year, um, really thinking about experiential learning, not just looking at it as a requirement, but how do I, how do I connect it to my major? How do I get uh, an early sense of what my career or what a, a path could look like? And how does that um, incorporate with their experiential learning and everything? 
Um, it's been really interesting. A lot of um, a lot of bright students and researchers have uh, helped us along the way with getting this information. So uh, we're helpful um, with them and helping to provide a lot of information for other institutions. Great, thanks. And now we'll go to the University of Central Oklahoma, and I think Jeff is going to give us a little bit of an overview on their program. Absolutely. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to share. Uh, and um, what I'll attempt to do in just a few minutes here is to give you just a quick overview about um, how our comprehensive learner record process works, because you have to have that in place, obviously, in order to generate whatever the data are or the um, pieces of information that a student, a learner, um, would want to reveal on the actual document itself, whether the document is electronic or a uh, hard copy. And so what you see on the screen before you um, is our Metro map visualization uh, for the five what we term stellar student transformative learning record the five stellar tenant areas. And you can see that there's some overlap with what Elon has. We've got leadership, we have research, creative, scholarly activity, and service learning and civic engagement. The other two in our mix are health and wellness and global and cultural competencies. So what the whole purpose of the CLR um, process is here at UCO is to help students develop in these what we can call beyond disciplinary areas. You might have heard them referred to as essential skills, soft skills. And um, we've been working with our Stellar Employer Advisory Board since almost the inception of Stellar. And so it was those hiring managers and uh, HR personnel who in a working session in October of 2016 sat down and told us okay, if uh, we've got a recent grad from UCO who has achieved at the top badge level in leadership, then these are the skills um, that we would expect that um, recent grad to possess at a relatively high level or, or functional level day one on the job. And we just took what they told us from those um, workout sessions, breakout groups, and all of that information and laid it out here. And so basically, what we're trying to do is develop students so that they possess these skills, but the second part of what our transformative learning record process does is also develop students um, in ways that owe very much to transformative learning, that conceptual base. And so our operational definition of transformative learning, which is reflected in the CLR, uh, is two-pronged. And the first prong is develop students in these beyond disciplinary areas. And the second prong is expand students' perspectives of their relationships to self, others, community, and environment. Uh, and that is the part that owes uh, very definitely to the um, conceptual base of transformative learning. So we have a process for doing all of this. We use the learning management system as the quote, system of record, where we capture all these data, then the results are surfaced in what you see on the screen now, which is what we term our stellar snapshot. And on the left hand side is what would be the front page. And typically these are a couple pages long. In this example, um, this hypothetical student has chosen to put leadership at the top um, because she has decided that in creating this particular version of her stellar snapshot uh, for applying at a particular or within a particular employer, leadership might need to be the thing that is emphasized on her CLR. For applying for another job, she may choose to have health and wellness move to the top. So these things are customizable by the students, but the important thing to note is anything that can show up on these have been vetted by the university, assessed at a particular badge level, and these do carry the registrar's seal. 
Um, so there's nothing that a student can put on here that is not drawn from the assessed, um, uh, the assessments that are created by faculty or staff. Um, but we like very much the formative aspect of student customizability because it helps get them into their CLR early on in their careers. Um, this is also formative in the sense that, for example, in, in um, having students apply for student worker positions, they have to submit their stellar snapshot. This gives them a chance to tell their own story in the interview for the student worker position with whatever version of the snapshot they have at the time to give them hands-on experience before they do this in the real world. The back of each of the pages is what you see on the right and our Stellar Employer Advisory Board recommended that we put um, what we call a rubrics abstract on the back of the pages for hiring managers not yet familiar with Stellar. This gives them the 60,000 foot view and lets them understand uh, what is uh, the difference between the varying uh, badge levels in each of these areas. It's really important to note, however, these are not the rubrics <laughs> that we use in assessing student reflective artifacts in each of the tenants. Those are much more robust and are built on AAC and use value rubrics. And so then finally, um, one point that I wanted to emphasize because people always ask us, how did you get buy-in from faculty? How did you get buy-in from students? Um, we designed all of this from the beginning to minimize any quote unquote extra work by the faculty. And in the system within the LMS, the rubrics uh, are easily, be, uh, they're easy to pull down, if you will, into the course shell by the faculty member. Faculty member simply cursors over a matrix to select research creative scholarly activity, integration, click, captured by the system, and uh, that's how we collect all these data. We have a process also for doing the same for co-curricular events, research um, that students do outside of class under the mentorship of faculty, student groups, for example, um, leadership development in uh, student government and so forth. And so um, that was one thing that helped with faculty buy-in, but our most important lesson learned there was this kind of a system allowed faculty to finally see their own personal impact and their classes personal impact on their students because they were getting that feedback in the form of these reflective artifacts. And so faculty very quickly told us, I always thought I was having an impact and I hoped I was having an impact in developing my students mm -hmm. as human beings. But until this mechanism, this tracking process and seeing for at least one assignment in each class every year that I have selected to associate to one or more of our stellar tenants, in the absence of seeing student reflections about this, I just didn't know. So that was a very important lesson learned for faculty buy-in. And the last slide that I have is just simply to show you some examples of student messaging um, you guys all know exactly what's going on here in the picture uh, at UCO with, you know, um, freshmen back. I actually snapped this uh, last Wednesday uh, and student organizations and whatnot uh, set up tables on campus for the new students to learn. Well, we um, provide stellar swag. Uh, it's a part of branding. Um, for a couple years, um, fanny packs, who would have guessed, were real um, popular with the students. But the number one thing they told us when we uh, surveyed them about what they wanted in Stellar Swag, because we stodgy old administrators always thought that that's um, t-shirts, that was at the bottom of the list. What you see in the bottom left-hand corner is the front of wire-bound notebooks. This is great for students 
On the inside front cover, uh, there's an explanation about what Stellar is and how it benefits them. But these things as giveaways are very popular. It saves them money. Uh, you can see students carrying them around on campus. So uh, the branding is important um, for anything like this to work because in our case, we discovered very early, it has to be a full institution um, uh, process. And that's why we convened at the beginning what we termed our stellar project team. And that had academic affairs, representatives, faculty, the student voice, student affairs, residential housing, um, uh, advising, you know, every, because Stellar touches all of those areas. So with apologies for the very fast fire hose, there's your 60,000 foot view about Stellar. Great, thanks. Um, and we're going to transition a little bit to um, NCO from University of Maryland Global Campus to kind of share some insights they have from their pilot they had done with this. This has some survey data that's been kind of powerful to hear from the student voice. So I'll turn it over to her at this point. Okay, thanks Kelly. Good morning. Um, so as Xander mentioned, U University of Maryland Global Campus was also fortunate to be part of a pilot um, that was funded through Lumina and uh, Acro and NASPA were also big participants. And um, our sole purpose of running this pilot was really just to find out student feedback on how they would use the document. So University of Maryland Global Campus really serves an adult population of which 74% of our student population actually worked full time. Um, and so for um, our document, we really wanted to focus on um, the competency-based learning aspects. And fortunately, um, at the time this pilot was going live, we were also going live with a couple of programs that were moving into a more competency-based learning model profile. Um, and so our MBA program and our cyber program and a couple others were launching at the same time. So it gave us a really nice sample size of about 2,000 students who would actually receive this document. Um, so I have a really quick snapshot here to kind of show you sort of what the document looked like and it has some of the uh, core features pointed out. Um, so the information was actually tra trickling in through our learning management system in real time. Um, and so basically a student would access the document right through their, their classroom and um, be able to kind of render the document in real time, which was a really, really great facet of this. Um, but you can see here that we had kind of the name of the class, um, the actual competency that was being focused on, the uh, specific things that you would be able to achieve once you've mastered that competency. Um, we had kind of, this was actually a really difficult thing to sort of capture, but uh, in many cases when there was um, more than one project that needed to be factored into the overall assignment um, and actual um, mastering of the competency. We wanted to try to find a way to show that, you know, the student was in progress of that. So we kind of have like an area here where it says in progress and then it shows kind of how far they are in actually accomplishing all of that evidence. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that this document was also printable um because a lot of students you know we were wondering if they would actually print it down and physically try to like take it somewhere like on an interview or that type of thing and get feedback on that um so we didn't do a lot of marketing around this essentially we placed it in the classroom um, we worked internally with our marketing team to kind of create sort of a um you know, a web page about it just so that people can kind of understand what it means and how it actually interacts with the traditional transcript, which is still our official transcript, and that it really works in tandem with that. Um, and then at the top on uh, in the red bar, you can see we had sort of an information icon there, and that's where students could actually um, get a survey on the, you know, giving us feedback on the document. So we had the survey, and then we also received feedback through um, a small focus group that we did as well. Next slide. Okay, so I'm just going to actually quickly go through some of the feedback that we received. Um, so one of the questions is really on the overall presentation of the document. 
So um, you can see over on the left, there's some comments here. Um, very detailed, describes students' achievements better than an A or B grade. Um, but we also got some, some interesting feedback in terms of how we could make it better. Um, so, you know, it could be more professional, um, maybe a table or listing. Um, in our focus group, uh, we actually had somebody who was actually a hiring manager, and, and one of the pieces of feedback that they provided is that, you know, the document is just too long. So it was one of the challenges that we faced in trying to actually um, incorporate all the different pieces of evidence and everything else. And so, you know, it had a few drop downs and things that all kind of came out in a printed version. And so it's something that we needed to work on. But overall, um, students enjoyed the look and feel of it. The usefulness of the content. Um, this was really an interesting aspect. Uh, I think many of our students in some of the, the comments that we received felt that the specific language that we used uh, that came from the rubric kind of helped them sort of um, build a resume and use that direct language to sort of represent their skills and how they learned something. And so I think for us, that was one of the biggest takeaways is you know sometimes we use this language in academia that we need students to translate when they're actually going on um, you know an interview or meeting with employers or trying to help articulate what their learning is um, and so this was kind of a um, you know an interesting find that we found about the specific content that we used on the document um, the name, we had a lot of trouble kind of figuring out a name that, that made sense to students. So um, you can see here, a lot of students, it didn't really resonate with them when we called it an ET. Um, it makes me think of electronic transcript. You know, it didn't quite represent, um, you know, the, the learning outcomes of the document. So I think that's something for a future state that we definitely need to work on. So who do you share the ET with? Um, I think uh, many people said future employer, admissions officers, and current employer, obviously with future employer being the, the highest rank. Um, but I thought it was interesting that we got, you know, that, that students sort of saw that they could use this in multiple ways. Okay, so in this question, we asked students um, if the ET would give them more confidence when searching for future opportunities. I think what was interesting here is that some students said no when others said that they weren't sure. And I think it's really kind of helping them understand this concept, right? I think many people just, when they think about anything that has transcript in the name, they're still thinking like, okay, like this is documenting that I've earned my degree. Um, instead of really resonating with them that, you know, it's really about the learning that you achieve along the way. Um, and so I think for us, it really sort of highlighted that we need to do a little bit of work on that and sort of make it part of that student's portfolio from the very beginning so that they can kind of see this document evolve and they can see their learning as they're going through their program or their certificate or whatever credential they're trying to achieve um, and really sort of understand it along the way and understand how to, how to use something like this. So that was an interesting takeaway. And then what else would you like to see on the ET? This was also really interesting because um, the majority of students said clubs or organizations related to your major. And really clubs or organizations um, on, on our you know, virtual campus is not really as prominent at it, as it is at traditional schools. Um, and so we found this interesting and we asked about it in the focus group. And you know, I think, I think students really just were kind of like, you know, I'm part of these other things that sort of support my education. So, so the more co-curricular side of things, and we could tell that um, they really wanted some autonomy over this document so that they could add in some of these achievements to sort of support what they're doing at the institution. And then in which scenarios do you feel the ET brings value to you as a student? Um, you know, most students said as an alumni seeking employment opportunities. So I think, um, you know, in all of these survey questions, it really resonated that we need to actually sort of do more work on the employer side. Um, and that's why for us, it's interesting to kind of see um, the work that Jeff was mentioning in the employer side of things there. Um, but I think that's something that we definitely need to do more work on so that we can understand the connectivity between the students learning 
and what employers are looking for on their end too. And then, you know, one of the last questions we asked is, should we make this um, available to all of our students? And, you know, there's some interesting um, feedback here. I think it makes the bigger picture of what the student is accomplishing clearer and describes how each project and course build on each other. I think that's pretty powerful. And then instead of, uh, instead of a graduate saying, I walked away from college with an X GPA, I can take this and say, this is what I'm capable of doing. And you know, that's really what we wanted students to take away from this type of document. Um, so we just, you know, th that sort of direct comments that we received from the survey were really powerful. I have a couple questions to start with. So I wanted to start with April. As a student, how have you used your CLR um, or are you planning to use your CLR as you finish your degree? Um, that's a really good question. Yes, I actually have used my CLR already. So I am a non-traditional student. I'm returning back to school. I'm fully, fully employed while I'm doing school at the same time. So um, I've actually used it in several ways already. One is I have given it to my current employers as I've been talking to them about my future with the organization that I'm with and talking to them about the things that I think it's making my degree seem um, even stronger because I'm able to supplement not just what I'm learning through my organizational leadership degree, but I'm actually able to say, you know, beyond that, I'm applying what I'm learning and here's how I'm currently applying what I'm learning. Um, I'm taking advantage of opportunities to go beyond just the discipline knowledge and you can see the progress of me doing that. And that's been a very um, insightful conversation with my current employer, but I'm also planning to use it to try to get some other jobs. You know, I've, I'm almost 40 years old. I've worked a ton of different jobs in my life and everybody asks very similar questions in an interview process. And it's often very difficult to know how to take your um, resume and make it really reflect what you are actually capable of doing and what you have done. Um, I'm also a parent of four kids and two of my kids are in college. And um, I've been really encouraging my daughter who is at UCO to get involved with um, stellar tagged opportunities because I can see how incredibly valuable it is from a parental standpoint as well as a student standpoint um, that there's just so so often that kids I'm seeing are just I got a piece of paper that should get me the job and I should be able to make you know twice as much as somebody that has all of this experience makes and it's just a very unrealistic perspective of the future and so I think that it's been really um, eye-opening to her as I've talked to her about it to say look you know this sets you above everybody else everybody else has the same piece of paper you have that are going for that job because that's a minimum requirement. You need to show why you are the maximum candidate for this, that you have more than just the minimum basic requirements, that you have um, the life skills and the ambition to actually make you a good employee. And um, so I have personally used it in quite a few different ways already, and I'm excited to finish building it out so I can um, take a fully completed one when I go to interviews for some jobs after I graduate, but I have talked to a couple of, I've interviewed while I'm working and I've taken my snapshot with me, which is kind of what we call our, our record. And I've taken that with me and said, okay, thank you for the interview. Let me show you beyond just these things. And it's been interesting because they've gotten really excited about it when they've seen it. And it's boosted my confidence in the interview process a lot because I feel like I actually have something to say. I'm not just giving a pat wrote answer. I'm actually able to pull from real experiences and say those things. So it's been extremely beneficial um, to me personally. Great. Uh, Mackenzie, do you have some information to share about Elon that you've heard from your students? Yeah, similar to the University of Maryland's global campus focus group results, um, and then something that April said of the comment of having a resume really represent what you're capable of and build that confidence within the interview. Um, the graduate apprentice previously in the office um, conducted a design thinking workshop with students regarding their perception of Elon's current experiential learning transcript. 
um, some peer institution um, CLRs, and then if they were to create their own CLR, what they would change about it. And so there are some takeaways from that workshop um, in that the design and visual presentation of the CLR really matters to the students, um, and they want that employer to be able to easily see the experiences that they have um, participated in and provide an adequate amount of detail um, for that. But also, um, one of the large pieces was the autonomy piece that they wanted with their CLR of um, their three different points. So students wanted to be able to include different experiences that were salient to their time in undergrad. And so Elon focuses in on those five experiences that Xander mentioned before. So students really wanted to focus in on some different experiences with some of those being um, significant class projects that they've participated in, certifications that they've received, scholarships, awards, on-campus jobs, and case study competitions. Um, but in addition to wanting the agency to display those experiences that are not typically displayed, they also wanted the ability to omit different experiences that were not as salient to their time in undergrad. Um, so it, different experiences that did not pr produce um, fruitful outcomes that they didn't really want to share with their future employer as they didn't see that it really built on top of um, the, the picture that they were trying to create. Um, and then the, finally, the students wanted the ability to add more detail or personalization to some of the experiences. So one of the examples is that um, one of the students wanted to add their learning outcomes to the internship experience that they had. So their future employer or graduate school would be able to see what they were really um, gaining from that internship that they participated in. Great, thanks for that. So um, as we kind of think about that in all across all of, across all of your instrument institutions, what are some of the benefits you're seeing from your CLR? What else are you hearing? What else are you seeing? Um, from those uh, projects. Yep. Jeff? Yep. Yeah, one of the things that we have heard uh, students say to us about um, our stellar snapshot is that um, it allows them to see their own development across time. Um, one of the comments, for example, that came from a capstone class, which very frequently does include the kind of assignment that has students reflecting on uh, their own growth and development within the discipline. Uh, but uh, students in capstone classes have sometimes said, well, thank goodness for Stellar because I didn't really remember what I did or how I thought when I was a freshman, but seeing their own thinking uh, as um, presented in the reflective artifacts uh, can be very powerful in helping them understand their own growth and uh, the upshot of that is that it makes it easier to tell their own story in an interview. Um, and what we have heard from employers uh, about the difference that makes on their side, meaning students being better able to tell their own stories, is that, uh, as one employer put it, it short circuits the dance that he typically has to take in a hiring interview mm -hmm. to finally drag out some of the things he's trying to find out because he says after he listens to students in a, an interview present themselves the way that they uh, are prepared to do, he listens politely, nods his head, and says that's all very, very impressive. How has any of that prepared you to add value to my company if I hire you for this position? And he said very typically the response is the deer in the headlights look because students haven't thought about, well, I say I'm a leader, how do I know I'm a leader? Where did I develop some of those capacities? How did that impact me? And if you're able as a student or a recent grad in this interview to be specific and to demonstrate that, um, we've heard from students that the Stellar Snapshot um, reminds them of this to help them prepare. And the final thing I'll say very quickly is that a different employer told us that the snapshot enables her to much more quickly know exactly the questions she wants to ask the interviewee 
as opposed to, again, having to maybe do a 15 minute dance to elicit enough information that's not on the academic transcript to finally drill into what she wants to know about the student. Does anyone else have feedback that they've heard from their employers that they work with? Um, I'll jump in here for a second. I actually just recently um, interviewed for a position that is, um, I'm currently a, an executive director for a statewide association and I interviewed for a position against um, 72 other people. I went through five rounds of interviews. Um, I was the only woman that was, was interviewed because the position was for very, um, very male dominated particular field and they'd never had a female executive director before. And I made it to the final two um, in an interview process. And a lot of that was because of the snapshot. Um, I was able to bring something that was completely different. I think if I just submitted my resume, I don't even know if I would have made it to the first round, but I was able to answer I use my snapshot, I use my experiences and answer the questions a little bit more in depth with more, I think, instead of a pat answer, I was, a, I felt equipped to, to be a little bit more reflective in how I was answering the questions, which propelled them to answer deep, uh, ask deeper questions. So it was a very, it was a very intense interview. Um, all five rounds of it. I think my last round was four and a half hours uh, of interviewing with 30 people around a conference table. And I didn't feel unprepared because I'd been able to think through everything that I knew I was capable. And quite frankly, it also highlighted some of my weaknesses, which employers ask a lot about your weaknesses. And it was I was able to kind of say, yes, I know what they are. Here's how I'm working to improve those weaknesses based on what my strengths are. Um, so I was able to do that. And um, I haven't heard back yet if I they're supposed to be deciding in the next week or so. So, but even if I don't get the job, I kind of felt like this was a win for me because I was able to really clearly think through and answer questions and, and see a whole experience something I probably wouldn't have experienced otherwise. And the interview process in and of itself was a growing experience. And I think that um, being able to take what I'm learning in my discipline knowledge with, of course, you know, my life skills, but quantifying my life skills through the snapshot, because I've kind of taken my snapshot and then added, you know, I'm not I'm not 20 anymore. So I've had other experiences that I've been able to kind of filter in, in my own head, how that applies, um, where, where those fit and kind of embellish and, and enhance that snapshot, um, in my presentation because I've had out of campus experiences as, as well. So it was extremely helpful to me personally. Great. So how are you guys working on translating the language we use in higher education to something that makes sense to uh, future employers? I know, Jeff, you mentioned a little bit during your presentation, but if anybody else has any tips they've used, um, because we do use a different language in higher education than employers typically use. Um, I'll jump in. So we, you know, we're, we kind of took a little hiatus after that first pilot. Um, so I'm sure many of you on the call who are from other uh, hired institutions know um, we've had a lot of changes, and um, we also really understood from the initial pilot that um, we had some work to do on the foundation for all of the work, which is really understanding the learning outcomes, the competencies, and, and mapping those things to skills, which um, for, for our institution that has about 90,000 students worldwide is, is really a big to-do, um, and there's a lot of coordination involved, so, so that's kind of where we are. But um, I will say that you know, in in this in this next iteration that we're currently working towards, um, some of the things that we're really looking into is when we talk about skills, we're focusing in on industry industry skills, right? So we're looking to um, language from uh, different places like Burning Glass and from MZ, 
um, to sort of support th that that language. Um, and instead of kind of looking at everything just from a you know rubric in the classroom type perspective, we're really looking at um, you know, translating and using the language that, that are used in job descriptions and used in those various places and kind of working backwards from there. And so there is some translation that's happening um, in the foundational work that'll, that'll support a, a future I, um, iteration of our CLR. Yeah, I'd love to, uh, from the Elon perspective, I'd love to point to um, the T3 Innovation Network, if anyone is aware of um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a lot of work um, with respect to the employer institution bridge, um, trying to develop competencies and trying to make sense of um, the work requirements that each industry or each position has and then how it relates to um, the competencies and the skills that might be learned in, um, say, the workforce um, or in higher education in general. Um, one thing that Elon's doing when it comes to bridging this gap between the the jargon the higher education jargon and how it's translating into work and everything um, is related to our academic catalog um, we have extensive information from our curriculum management systems on all of the competencies the skill like what a student is expected to learn over a course a program a major minor um, and so we've been able to tie that into our certified electronic diploma that once a student completes their uh, once they graduate, once they complete their program, they'll get their electronic diploma. But then along with that, we're embedding that information that's found in the catalog as well. Um, we've just started thinking of that we don't have an experiential learning catalog or anything either. We don't have um, any descriptions or information on what you might uh, what you might learn on a study abroad experience or what you might learn from an internship. And given that the internships might be so broad that um, the employer, they might be arranging so drastically in those uh, different experiences, but at least we're able to provide some information from the catalog level on these are things you might expect in a syllabus for an internship per se. Um, and then that's able to tie to that, that final document that you receive. Um, of course, that, that diploma is just as similar as um, a static academic transcript, it needs to still be dynamic, it still needs to be able um, to be malleable in some aspect. Um, I just saw a quick question. We have um, Watermark as our curriculum management system, um, so we've been speaking with them a little bit um, from the curriculum management side. Great, thanks. So as you're working with students, what are the questions that your students are hearing related to CLR? Um, how do they see the relationship between a CLR and the traditional transcript? What are you, you know, what are you doing to support the students as they start to use and develop their CLR? I can jump in uh, quickly here uh, to say that, of course, we work really, really closely with our career development center. Uh, and so the normal things that all career development centers have at universities um, the ability, for example, to uh, provide mock interviews, um, to work with students on their resumes. Uh, but that's a very key piece to make sure the career development um, unit and operation is looped in so that they are able to highlight the benefit of, um, in our case, the stellar snapshot, uh, so that students are actually uh, very aware of how they have the value add of this tool in preparing for future employment. Another mechanism, of course, are the uh, career fairs. Um, if students know that one of the expectations at a university in a career fair um, is to not just be there with their resume, but to also be there with um, the hard copy printout, if you will, of the stellar snapshot, um, then that is some another way uh, that you start building bridges into the employ employment sector uh, in the area. And so um, in terms of helping our students um, and supporting them in using this, one of the places where it comes up very frequently are the capstone classes. And as I mentioned before, because of the nature of what you're supposed to be accomplishing as a student in a capstone class, um, that's where getting familiar um, and actually selecting the stellar engagements that you want to reveal 
uh, we did have to put a limit on 50 of those. I mean, it's literally possible for a student to graduate here with 250 stellar engagements. Um, and just to keep this thing from going on and on and on, we had to say for each of the five tenants, you can reveal up to a maximum of 10 of those engagements. Um, but in that capstone process, the ability to see all 250 uh, is very useful. And um, that's another supportive environment for helping students understand their snapshots. Um, I will just jump in and say, I think it was an interesting challenge for us um, when we were calling this a pilot, because I think, you know, um, we really have to partner with marketing on helping us sort of develop that language to, to help students kind of understand, like, you know, this is in tandem with your official transcript. And, you know, again, it's just helping them understand how, how, they, how they can use it, why we were doing something like this, how, how it can support their learning. So, um, you know, I think just helping establish that sort of learning um, from the beginning and, and that understanding from the beginning about what it is and how they can use it sort of throughout it is really key. I think one thing I will say as just a reminder is, you know, having a, a daughter in college and working on the UCO campus in addition to the other things I'm doing, um, this doesn't become relevant until you're starting to look for a job for a lot of students. You know, I mean, we would love to see them just grasp a hold at their very first orientation and never let go. But the reality is, is that, they don't think that far down the path, you know, and until they're suddenly going, oh my gosh, I showed up for an interview for my first real job and there's 10 other people in the room that are going to interview for the same job. I don't know how much it really sinks in. And so um, if I can just encourage you all, it, it does work. And a lot of times what I'm hearing is I'm talking to freshman students that are like, oh yeah, you know, I'll do that one day. And then I'm talking to the juniors and seniors that are like, oh, this is extremely vital. I need to beef this up because I'm thinking about moving on. You know, I need, I need to start getting some more stellar credits. I need to start doing some more engagement. And so I think some of it is when you're catching them in their college process of when it becomes really valuable to them. Um, and it doesn't always click as early as we would like it to. I keep telling this to my daughter. It doesn't always click as, as quickly as I want it to quick click with her. But, you know, <laughs> it is going to get there because eventually, you know, I'm going to say fly a little birdie and she's going to have to actually do something. And I think it will become way more relevant then. And so knowing that it's there, that they can go back and pull from it when they have that moment, I think is is really important. Um, I like the ability to, to know that even when they're not realizing they're doing assignments that are stellar tagged, and even when they don't make the connection that when they swipe their card, they're getting credit for that, eventually those dots are gonna connect and then they're gonna be really thankful that they had, that they have that record there. You know, it's not necessarily something they're playing with throughout their entire college tenure as much as it is oh, wait, I got to actually go get a job now. And I don't know what I actually think about anything. And now they can kind of pull that together. So, so that's just kind of one of my thoughts about that. Yeah, I think, I think what April said was just is really, really interesting, because it's, it's kind of similar to a conversation that we're having in terms of kind of having this document evolve as a student moves through their life cycle. And so like, what does it look like if we give it to them on day one? On day one, is it really just kind of um, a, a, a picture of what's ahead? And, um, you know, is there a progress bar that as they're checking in, they can kind of see kind of how far they're going throughout their program. And, you know, they have a, a good visual in front of them of like what it takes to actually complete that degree. How does it change if they decide to change direction and, and take a different program plan? Um, and so I think, you know, I think it's a really interesting question that um, institutions who are considering moving in this direction, you know, at what point do the students, you know, receive the document? Um, does it evolve along the way? And, and, when, and when do they really get the most bang, bang out of it, you know? So I think those are all are all good questions. 
So knowing that we're almost out of time, I just wanted to ask kind of each of the institutions, how are you going to know when you're successful? How will you know if it's been impactful for students? What are your kind of thoughts? And Jeff, do you want to start us off? Uh, yes. Uh, the reason I was waving my hand a second ago is, and thank you, Kelly, it was just the thing I was going to talk about. Um, knowing it's success for students um, has very much been wrapped up here, I think, in the process of um, this provides a way to track in an evidence-based manner, students' development. And the big, big difference between doing that and just listing things that students have been involved in on a record, which doesn't then require them to reflect on their own development across time, is something that I think would be a missed opportunity. So I think success here at UCO is because that process is in place and it's great for the faculty too. Xander, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess because Elon has fully implemented our uh, comprehensive learner record, I think the, the key success in the case um, is eventually creating a unified system. Um, one thing that I've, I've always thought about is the co-curricular learning element that we have is kind of the bridge between our, our student affairs and academic affairs. Um, it bridges that gap because you have courses, you have internships that are related to this academic level, but then you have the student affairs connection um, where students can freely participate in events, volunteering, um, other opportunities that are still valuable and still hold, um, that still hold weight for the institution and for themselves. Um, but then how do we capture that? It's somewhere in the middle. Um, there's a gray area and um, Elon at the moment right now is a pretty decentralized system when it comes to our experiential learning. It's a, a, we've been talking about it for decades in higher education about how everything is siloed and we need to find interoperability um, and, and find some, we know the overlaps, but we just know that there are barriers. Um, Elon's still facing that trouble with their experiential learning right now. Um, and so that's one key indicator is if we can create a unified system that bridges all these networks um, that kind of just breaks up all of that mess and everything. Um, another thing that I wanted to kind of touch on, and this is kind of mission related, um, Elon has put a lot of focus um, just given the summer of um, the systemic racism, the, the focus on um, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, is that experiential learning can focus a lot of um, because now we're, we're tracking all of this experiential data, um, not only just the, the academics that we can point to, but also how students are engaged on campus. Um, we can now point to um, how, how students of all different backgrounds are participating in activities where there might be um, lack of opportunities or barriers that, were, that are unintended. Um, but th that we can certainly address and, and look forward to um, as a university, as an, an administration. Great. And then, Incia, what about you for your institution? Um, I would say that when employers come back to us and say, you know, we, we really are looking for University of Maryland Global Campus students to apply here because we know that the education that they're receiving um, is making an impact on our companies and that, you know, we can tie that back to students using something like a CLR to really um, articulate their learning. So I think that's, that's one thing. And then I think um, the, the second part would really be when, when something like this is embedded into um, our overall institutional strategy and runs the gamut from our, our recruitment strategies through to retention, and we can see um, some differences there based on the document. So for me, that those would be measures of success. Great, thank you very much. And thank you to all of the institutional participants today uh, for sharing their stories and sharing their information. Lots of good information. Before we go, I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeff for just one second to share some crucial information about the CLR standard, and then I'll wrap up and share some information about our next event in September. Yeah, thanks also to our speakers for sharing um, their stories, testimonials about impact on students. Um, from a technical perspective, um, I want to also emphasize the point that 
it's the standard that allows the data to flow from system to system. And ultimately, when a learner applies for a job and they share their information in a resume, they can also include the CLR data. And that data can be processed by these um, sophisticated uh, machine learning uh, AI powered systems. And we believe that people are going to be discovered for jobs based on their skills and their abilities that are in these CLR documents. Uh, and they're going to be identified for jobs that they didn't even know they were a good fit for. So we're excited about the possibility at IMS, our members are working hard on connecting those parts of the digital ecosystem, and uh, the, the future is, is just around the corner. So um, it, when you are working on your CLR projects at your institutions, it's really important you discuss support of the CLR standard with your technology partners so that we can have this connected digital ecosystem that benefits the students. Yep, thank you for everyone. Um, just as a note, uh, mark your calendar for September 28th. Um, we will do our next uh, roundtable at that point at the same time that we did this one. Uh, we're looking at doing it around tools that will, you can use to support your CLR initiative. There will be a slight change where we'll ask for some pre-registration information just so it'll be easier to follow up with you and you won't have to sign in when you attend. Um, that information will be posted later today on our website. Um, and that is there. And then also, um, if you have any questions on the follow-up email you'll get from me, as well as on that in, on that website, you'll have an option to stay informed, share any feedback or suggestions, or if you have a CLR project you would like to help um, share with others at this point, um, you can fill out that form and we'd be in touch to see if you'd be interested in participating in a future roundtable. So thank you very much and have a great day.